All right, greetings everyone and uh, welcome to the APOC Japan program webinar on Japan's foreign policy in the aftermath of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Uh, my name is Kyoteru Tutsui and I'm the director of the Japan program at the Shorenstein Asia Pacific Research Center at Stanford University. Uh, it's been nearly two months since Rush, uh, Russia's invasion started and the whole world has been following the news coming out of Ukraine and reacting with horror, compassion, anger, administration, uh, admiration, uh, despair, empathy, and various other strong emotions. Um, and this uh, invasion, this war, is most certainly one of the defining events of our lifetime. And it has produced a seismic shift in foreign policy of many countries in the world. And today we'd like to focus on the impact of the war uh, in Ukraine um, on Japan's foreign policy. Um, the security environment for Japan was already quite challenging uh, with two nuclear powers, China and Russia in its neighborhood and another one emerging in North Korea. And there was already a growing concern about China's intentions in East China Sea and South China Sea. And Japan has uh, worked hard to develop a coalition of like-minded countries in the region with the US-Japan alliance as a cornerstone of its foreign policy. Um, and the war in Ukraine has sparked new debates in Japan about its defense policy, nuclear sharing, its approaches to territorial disputes in the region uh, from the Senkaku, Taiwan to the Northern Territories. Just as it, uh, the war has changed the discourse um, around foreign policy issues in the US, Europe, and many countries in the world. And with all these complex issues to think about, we are very fortunate to have two leading experts today from Japan to discuss these issues. Uh, first, we have Hiro Akita, an award-winning journalist who has been at Japan's premier business publication, Nikkei, newspaper for decades. He has served as a foreign correspondent uh, both in Washington and Beijing, uh, also in other places. And he's currently a distinguished uh, commentator writing opinion pieces in Nikkei. Uh, he has two influential books in Japanese, um, focusing on the relationships among Japan, the United States, and China, with the most uh, recent one being Randu, uh, strategic competition of the US, Japan, and China in 2016. And second, we have uh, Professor Yoko Iwama, who is Professor of National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies, GRIPS, uh, where she is also the Director of Security and Strategy Program and Maritime Safety and Security Program. Uh, she is a leading expert of international security and diplomatic history of Europe, uh, Europe broadly and particularly around NATO, Germany, uh, and nuclear strategy. She has published many influential books on those issues, both in English and Japanese, with the most recent one being the 1968 Global Nuclear Order and West Germany that was published in the summer of 2021, last summer. But I'm delighted to have these uh, two foremost experts on Japan's foreign policy and security environment to discuss the impact of Russia's invasion of Ukraine on Japan's foreign policy. And we will proceed in first in two parts. In the first part, we'd like to focus on Japan's reaction, immediate reaction, uh, both in terms of um, public debates about uh, what's happening in Ukraine, and also the immediate policy responses by the Japanese government. And in the second part, uh, we'd like to talk about a more of a long-term policy impact uh, of uh, war in Ukraine uh, in terms of its impact on the international security environment, but also specifically on Japan's security policies. So without any further ado, please join me in welcoming uh, Akita-san and Iwama-sensei. And uh, I'd like to start with uh, Akita-san on the first part, first part about Japan's uh, reaction to the war in Ukraine. Akita san, please. I mean, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for having me. It is my honor to speak with uh, Professor Iwama and also Professor Sui. And also, uh, it is very good to see a very beautiful box screen 
picture with the cherry blossom with the Amazon sea and the nice uh, colonial architecture, I guess it is a part of uh, Stanford University. So I have to apologize for providing a very, very boring back screen. <laughs> Uh, and I, I will try to improve it from next time. Anyway, uh, I, in my short uh, first uh, comment, I'd like to illustrate uh, Japan's response to Russian invasion, uh, both by government and also reaction from public. Um, Japanese government has been responding uh, to this invasion with a series of heavy sanctions. And uh, Kishida, it is clear departure from Japanese uh, past approach to Russia. Uh, in 2014, when Russia annexed Crimea, uh, Japan didn't uh, put the heavy sanctions on Russia because at that time, Japan tries to maintain a stable relation with Putin government. Uh, maybe because of two purposes. One is to avoid a uh, two front simultaneous uh, confrontation, both with China and Russia, because Japan has territory disputes, both with Beijing and Moscow. So at least Japan tried to maintain good relation of stable relations with uh, Mr. Putin to focus on China. And at the time also, uh, then Prime Minister Abe had uh, hoped, hoped to settle territorial dispute, or at least make a progress on the negotiation to solve uh, over the four northern, uh, four northern island, now occupied by Russia. So therefore, uh, Prime Minister Abe, former Prime Minister Abe, during his tenure, met uh, Mr. Putin for 20, 27 times face to face. But this time, uh, the Japanese government response shows stark contrast from 2014. Uh, one of the biggest decisions, according to the Japanese official, uh, made by Prime Minister Kishida was to impose sanctions on Mr. Putin and also Foreign Minister Lavrov himself. It was early March. And this decision may, means that uh, Japan will no longer uh, regard uh, Mr. Putin as a counterpart. So no negotiation for peace treaty or no cooperation unless uh, Mr. Putin will withdraw from Ukraine. So this is a kind of big uh, change and stark contrast. And this means that Japan will, uh, this is caused, um, this decision uh, was made because obviously what is happening in Ukraine is so terrible and horrible. And also uh, now Japan has no illusion to maintain friendly relation with uh, Russia under Mr. Putin. So that is a big change. So specifically speaking, uh, Japan uh, Kishida administration has been uh, closely working with US and also European countries and introduced uh, sanctions such as freezing financial assets of uh, Russian leaders and also put the ban on the import from Russia, including a ban on restrictions uh, on import from Russia, like a coals or some other goods and eliminating uh, most favored nation status uh, given to Russia. So these are the, uh, and also yeah, Japan uh, decided to provide a wallet proof jacket. Uh, that is not the you know, lethal weapons, but this is a politically big decision for Japan because this is a virtually first time for Japan to provide uh, defense equipment to the country under the uh, war. So, uh, Japan, uh, it is also politically, uh, you know, an extraordinary uh, decision Japan made. So what about the public uh, reaction to that? As far as public polls shows, uh, Japan's public strongly support uh, government uh, policy or approach to uh, Russia. 
Um, according to uh, Asahi newspaper's poll last week, uh, I'm afraid uh, it is not Nikkei, but the Asahi newspaper, um, about the 70% of people think that Japan should keep uh, imposing tough sanctions on Russia, even if it will cause a negative impact on Japanese, Japan's economy. And moreover, uh, according to the same poll, about 90% of people support uh, Prime Minister Kishida's comment that defines a uh, mass killing of civilians in Ukraine by, by Russian troops as war crime. So 90% of people. So basically, and also Japan uh, uh, started to embrace uh, refugees from Ukraine. So far, I think it's about uh, 400. Uh, some of them have already has asked, uh, starting to arrive in Japan. 400 is a very small number in comparison to European countries or US, of course. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, Japan virtually uh, has not accommodated, embraced uh, so many uh, refugees, uh, or very only few refugees. So in that context, uh, this is quite a fast move. So maybe I will stop here and I wait for a discussion. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, by and large, I, I agree with Akita-san. Um, one uh, decision that has come recently, uh, another groundbreaking, groundbreaking decision, I think was the decision to send self-defense force airplane to probably Poland uh, as, a, as a sign of humanitarian help. Um, it has been um, decided uh, responding to the request from UNHCR. So this is not a military move, it's a humanitarian move. Nevertheless, um, I think uh, it, it really uh, sets a, a big example that self-defense force airplane lands in probably some Polish uh, military airfield, I would imagine, um, to help the refugees. So I think it really becomes a symbol uh, that Japan is this time really acting as a part of the Western um, international society and um, as a as a member of G7. Um, I think we're all um, more or less satisfied, happy uh, having uh, Prime Minister Nakishida as a leader at this very difficult time. Um, as you all know, there was a, a change of government uh, last year. Uh, and so we had already broken with this uh, several years of uh, tradition of Abe foreign, minis, uh, foreign policy, uh, one of which was to um, deal with the long delayed uh, Second World War, um, the end of the Second World War with Russia or Soviet Union, whichever you, way you see it, uh, including the Northern Territories, of course. Um, and that, I don't think uh, anybody really had any optimistic feeling about these islands um, in, in these maybe 20 years. There might have been a chance, you know, immediately after the, the breakdown of the Soviet uh, Union. I, I'm not an expert on this, I don't know. But after the stabilization of uh, Russian domestic politics, I, I really don't think anybody had much hope about uh, the fact that uh, these islands are coming back in a, in a reasonable way. Um, somehow, there were people who persuaded Prime Minister Abe uh, and his surroundings that uh, you can persuade uh, Lamini Putin into doing this uh, in exchange for certain economic inducements. And that illusion was around for many years. I think it has done more damage to our foreign policy than any, any service. Um, I think that's, we can say reasonably that, that we had this, this view for a very long time, even during the time uh, that uh, this Abe foreign policy was in full blow and uh, Mr. Putin was visiting uh, uh, Japan and so on. 
Um, of course, there were lots of expectation in, in newspapers, but I don't know any of my friends who really had high expectations that anything was going to happen. We, we all saw that as a, um, Putin getting what he wanted by sort of showing around uh, possibilities which never really existed. So um, I'm just looking at this question uh, from Mr. Galperovich. Um, uh, I don't really know subject of negotiation to subject of demand. I don't think any of us had any um, reasonable hope of those islands coming back. This is quite different from Okinawa, where you had uh, lots of people living there, Japanese citizens, whereas in Northern Territories, uh, we don't have any, any um, Japanese, well, not many uh, Japanese residents left on those islands. So I think uh, the situation is quite different. Um, the strategic logic is also totally different. Um, we were, you know, we remained part of US-Japan alliance when the Okinawa Islands came back. And as you know, there's still lots of uh, American bases left there. So America uh, could keep its strategic interest even it gave back these islands. That would not be the case uh, for the Northern Territories. So I do not have any high hope uh, of those coming back. Um, back to the Japanese uh, reaction. And uh, as Akita-san said, there are broad public support for um, the way uh, government has dealt with this crisis. I think people are happy that we have shown solidarity with the Ukrainian uh, people. Um, the resistance and the, the amount of uh, um, capability of Ukrainian armed horses has been a surprise here in Japan as well as in any other countries. And I think that really contributed to building up the support in Japan. And on the other hand, you have um, a lot of atrocities news coming in uh, from uh, the other side. Um, there has been marginal reactions. Uh, I've just said 80, 90% support. Well, 10, 20%, there's been sort of different kinds of um, reactions. Uh, one would be that, you know, both sides are to blame kind of argument that, and this exists actually in, in other countries as well, that it was, uh, um, as you can see in the example of Professor Mishima, that it was all Ukraine's fault or both sides are to blame. Um, of course, there were lots of things that happened before, but it doesn't justify in any way the, the um, way that Putin has really um, stepped down upon the sovereignty of, a, of, a, of an independent nation and further has cry, um, committed so many war crimes. But there have been um, at the fringe people saying that both sides are to be blamed. And then there has been this strange Pacific a pacifist reaction that war must immediately stop. Therefore, Ukrainians has to surrender kind of argument. Um, you see it here and there. Um, I think this is kind of naivety from not knowing this long, long history of how Russian's neighbor has suffered uh, from uh, many military operations. We've been part of it um, at the end of the Second World War. The Russians have committed quite similar atrocities in Manchuria and uh, other parts of Northern Asia, where they liberated uh, the locals from Japanese armed forces. But um, those have not been made really into our conscious sort of historical past. People know about it. Um, educated people know about it, but I don't think it's in the, for example, elementary school textbooks. Uh, you would always see uh, Hiroshima Nagasaki, but not what happened in Manchuria because uh, of uh, many reasons. So that has been the sort of a pacifist kind of reaction. Uh, on the other extreme, there has been sort of nationalistic, militaristic reaction, uh, and, and one the curious thing has been uh, nuclear weapons, that somehow you have to 
have nuclear weapons. We see Ukraine being treated as it is because Ukraine gave it its nuclear weapons. Therefore, Japan must try somehow to get its hand on nuclear weapons. Um, and so this suddenly popped up a debate about nuclear sharing. Um, I think there were several people before, including Ishiba uh, san uh, arguing for nuclear um, sharing before. But after the start of the Ukrainian crisis, this argument suddenly really took off, uh, and including people like Prime Minister Abe, I think uh, Takaichi Sanae also I guess for it, um, several other people in, in LDP, um, nationalistic wing, has uh, strongly said. And then there's a um, former, what's the word, chief of staff, uh, Kawano Sam, and uh, former cabinet secretary, uh, diplomat, um, uh, Nobukatsu Kanehara and several others who say it's now the time to, it's now time to talk about nuclear sharing with the Americans because without nuclear weapons we're going to be treated like uh, like Ukrainians and uh, the China will not uh, hesitate from uh, crossing the Taiwan Strait that kind of very simplistic argument has been on the on the right uh, far right edge so there's been sort of 10%, 10% each, I would say, um, kind of extreme reactions. But all in all, I think Japanese uh, domestic uh, uh, public opinion has reacted very, um, has taken this very, uh, as a matter of fact, way. Um, you have seen different kinds of reactions from countries like Hungary and even France, that people are disturbed and, uh, and frightened and uh, destabilized internally by this by this um, uh, crisis. Uh, of course, we are far away, so we can sort of afford to remain um, philosophic and more moral. But uh, I think that's uh, that's my take at the moment. Wonderful. Thank you both. Uh, and I should have mentioned at the beginning that um, the audience, uh, please feel free to submit your questions in the Q&A box. And we already have a couple of questions and Iwama sensei already addressed one of them. Um, to, to Daniela um, Gelperovic has another question about why, um, well, how does Japanese society reacted to, reacted to Japanese government's um, sort of change of course in its uh, policy toward Russia. And, and Akita-san already presented this public opinion poll evidence that uh, overwhelming majority of the Japanese actually support um, the condemnation of war crimes by Russia and really just um, supporting um, Ukraine has a great deal of support among the Japanese public. It's, it's, it's very clear. And that begs the question, and also it relates to the second question from Yamada Miksan um, about why the response is so different today compared to the response, the Japanese response in 2014 when uh, Russia took over the premier. Um, and, and also uh, Daniela Gilperovich points out how um, Prime Minister Abe really wined and dined President Putin trying to negotiate a deal on um, the ending of the World War II and also uh, Northern Territories. Um, in hindsight, what, uh, so the, the, maybe it was that there wasn't that much support uh, toward Prime Minister Abe's policy toward Russia, and now it's kind of coming out um, but looking at Japan's public debate, and maybe I'm not looking in the right places, but looking at some Twitter sphere and um, you know some news uh, news shows in Japan, there are, there's a sort of outsized presence, uh, over representation of pro-Russia discourse. It seems to me relative to other countries in the world. Uh, but when you look at the public opinion, in addition to the one that we just discussed, there's another interesting one: cross-national. Um, polls on who to blame for this conflict in, in Ukraine. And Japan ranks the highest in terms of uh, blaming Russia. So the public actually seems to recognize this is um, Russia's doing and blame Russia. Uh, interestingly, in China, people blame the United States more than Russia, which is, I don't know how that works, but they, they see it that way. Even in the United States, some people blame the United States rather than uh, Russia. 
But so the Japanese public seem to understand, uh, from our point of view, understand the situation accurately. Uh, but how, what do we make of this shift uh, in public discourse from 2014 to today? And also uh, comparing, um, compared to the public discourse in other countries, and here I think maybe Iwama sensei could um, shed insight on the discourse in Europe and how the reaction, public reaction to the war might be different um, in Europe compared to, uh, to Japan. Um, either one, if you wanna shed some light on this topic. So sh shall I go first? Yes, please. In turn? <laughs> okay, so I think that the it's a key question about why uh, this time Japanese public overwhelmingly support Japan's very tough response, while uh, in 2014, uh, annexation of Crimea, Japan didn't uh, react it so strongly. I think there are uh, three reasons. One, simple reason is annexation of Crimea is a very, very terrible uh, violation to international law and rule. But this time, uh, you know, scale of what the Russia is doing is totally different dimension. It's full scale invasion to a neighboring uh, country. And uh, people perceive this as, uh, you know, as long as, uh, as well as other countries. And in Japan, it is perceived as one of the most dangerous uh, era after Cold War after the end of Cold War, or even after the end of World War II. So there is an instinct among Japanese public that uh, we, we means Japan, also do need to contribute to let Mr. Putin fail. In other words, if Mr. Putin uh, will succeed in annexing uh, Donbas or some of uh, Ukraine, or, you know, uh, will succeed to uh, control Ukraine as a whole, it will be a totally different uh, world. So this is kind of a sense of urgency of Japanese public. Of course, Japanese public do not think that, uh, you know, uh, uh, Japanese people's kind of uh, instinct. So that is the first thing first element. But second element is that uh, sense of vulnerability of Japanese public, it's related to the first uh, element, but there is a growing sense of insecurity, I think, in Japan, uh, because of North Korean uh, nuclear missile development, and also, of course, a potential uh, conflict in Taiwan Strait, and also, uh, Japan will not uh, forget uh, Trump era when uh, US allies faced a kind of risk being, of being abandoned from the US. So I think that a Japanese government, Japan's government, as well as public, uh, think that it is time, it, Japan really needs to show the solidarity to uh, help uh, Ukraine together with other allies and also like-minded country, uh, because you know, if Japan do not do it, support, maybe when Japan will be in danger, that will you know, cause uh, serious repercussion. So the second is a sense of vulnerability of Japanese uh, people or government uh, make Japan reactive very proactively to Ukraine. And thirdly, uh, I think that the Japan, uh, Jap strong, uh, deep disappointment to uh, uh, Japanese, the fa or to, to caused by the kind of like a de facto failure of Japanese approach to Russia since uh, in past decade. Uh, Japanese public, uh, as Yama Sensei, Yama, Professor Yama described, Japanese people do not necessarily believe or hope, believed that uh, through the negotiation, Japan can get uh, for those uh, islands get returned to Japan. But 
uh, at least Japan, uh, Japanese public and Japanese government uh, hoped that uh, Japan and Russia will be able to coexist under the peace treaty. We don't have a peace treaty with Russia. So four islands is, is kind of symbolic uh, obstacle, but the Japan once hoped that maybe we will be able to sign a peace treaty to further normalize its relation with Russia. Russia will not be a maybe friendly country, but at least a coexist under the peace treaty. But the, after the failure of a Japan's Russian approach, um, I think there is a deep disappointment or maybe a kind of a rational acknowledgement among Japanese public that uh, we cannot hope uh, so much uh, from uh, uh, Russia under Putin regime. So these are the three elements combined together and made Japanese reaction. That is my observation. Thank you. Um, if I can add just one thing. Um, if you think Japan's change is uh, abrupt, uh, you should look at Germany. And there, the policy turnaround has been phenomenal, really. Um, we share Japan and Germany rather similar um, security culture of being restrained, uh, not really sort of uh, going ahead to use force as such, but trying always to work in multilateral, multinational environment, um, seeking to uh, name our activities peace, some sort of peace operations, instead of saying this is war, right? That had been our culture. And you've seen Germany turn around overnight, virtually. It was really overnight. Um, I haven't counted the days, but uh, you just saw um, uh, Prime Chancellor Schultz uh, turning around and saying, uh, uh, we're not going to accept this. We are going to start spending 2% of our GDP on, on defense year after year after year. That was virtually what he said. And we haven't heard that from Prime Minister Kishida yet. So I don't really think Japan's reaction chain, um, policy change has been quick. Uh, I think it has been, well, relatively slow, relatively slow. Um, it's a big change, but it's not happening in the speed that uh, is happening in Germany um, uh, for certain reasons, I think. I mean, we are still far away from, from Ukraine. Um, we don't really see refugees pouring into our, our railway stations, which is happening in both Poland and Germany. Um, they have received millions and we've only received hundreds. So there's, a, there's a, this distance uh, which uh, accounts for the, for me, slow reaction of Japanese politics. Um, Crimea, as Akita-san said, was a local uh, is, mm, crisis. Now, I think, you know, things would have been totally different if Putin had concentrated his military efforts on the eastern regions from the beginning, instead of just hitting uh, Kiev and trying to uh, topple the government and set his own puppet government there. I think that was his plan, and to do it in a very short time, which failed as we saw. But if he had really concentrated on the two um, eastern regions uh, and sort of uh, put up a nationalistic, um, reasons reasonings for for um, occupying those uh, territories I think international and Japanese uh, reactions would have been different it, it, they would have treated as a kind of a border dispute but this was really an assault on sovereignty of one independent country it was a totally different degree and I think therefore um, we took it as such and reacted because uh, this was really, it, it goes to the fundamentals of, of international order that we, we rest on. If you let these things happen and do not denounce it, 
um, who would be on the line next. So I think that was very clear. And I totally agree about the um, disappearance of illusions that some may have had concerning uh, Russia, that uh, you can sort of um, hope that you can talk these people into friendships. Um, you know, it may not be a good thing that uh, for, if you see it from diplomacy, that uh, you put all the blame on the Russians and uh, cut all the ways uh, for um, somehow to build peace. Um, but the extreme um, nature of the conduct of war, I think, has made it rather uh, impossible to avoid. But I have to add that we've been here before. Uh, if you look at international history and if you look at Russia and what they've done, um, if you look at how East and West Germany was divided in the years from 1945 to 1949, there were just so many rapes, abductions, taking away of private property, uh, horrendous human rights violations, 1945 to 1949, and the alienation of people's minds was one reason why West Germany decided to go its own way instead of sticking to the whole entity of Germany. And uh, we've seen it, uh, um, 1995 Chechnya war is kind of very similar uh, to what's going on currently. So we've seen it again and again. You look at Finnish-Soviet relations and you see very similar things happening again and again. And so um, this kind of desperation that Russia does not change after all these years and after all these sad histories has really sort of driven the reaction to the extremes, I think. I'll stop here. Wonderful, thank you. Um, one last question about public discourse in Japan. So in the US, there's a lot of uh, framing of the, the conflict right now as being one between good and evil or democracy versus authoritarianism. Uh, I mean, it's a little bit of an oversimplification and I worry a little bit about the tendency in the US to, to see world affairs in that way. But I don't, I don't know if I hear a lot of that in Japan. And, and Japan, I think, is primed to um, adopt this framing with China being a, a major threat. So in the US, China and Russia are kind of you know, bundled together as authoritarian, kind of potentially evil uh, enemies. Um, and you know, US is trying to form an alliance, alliances and coalitions with like-minded countries, try to move all those swing states in ASEAN and potentially India and you know, all those countries to, to the democracy, the good side. Uh, I don't know if I hear a lot of that kind of argument in Japan. Is there a um, discussion, maybe I'm just missing it. Is there a discourse around that? Like talking about how this is part of the conflict between democracy and author authoritarianism and Japan as a part of democracy you know, needs to play its, its role. I think policymakers make that argument, but in public debates, uh, do you hear a lot of that? Uh, okay, uh, maybe I will uh, present journalistic observation, <laughs> and uh, maybe I'm I'm sure that uh, Professor Yuama will uh, provide more solid <laughs> answer to that. I think that uh, on the first, uh, so yeah, I put this I put this way. Unlike U.S., Japanese geopolitical location, geopolitical environment is very, very bad. Japan is surrounded by China, Russia, and North Korea. So there is a sense of, again, there is a sense of vulnerability or insecurity much deeper than the people in the US. Maybe I assume that I lived in US. So I might I imagine that for the people in the US, the retreat over democracy or retreat over US red liberal order in the world means direct threat to uh, US national interest and also maybe in long run survival of US as a, a leader of the world. So this is maybe uh, one of the uh, reasons why 
uh, American people may uh, see the, this war in Ukraine through the prism of uh, democracy versus dictatorship or autocracy. And I wouldn't say that uh, Japanese people have that kind of prism. I'm sure they have, and I have. As I said, uh, Japan, uh, I, I think that if uh, this Mr. Putin will win this war, this will mean the total retreat of a liberal world order, and that will directly damage Japanese national interest too. But moreover, we are facing a North Korean missile, a North Korean nuclear missile threat every day, and we are facing uh, bears, which is Russia, more violent bears, visibly, and also dragon, China. US is separated by sea, but we are facing it physically. So I think that the sense of urgency that, oh, we have to support Ukraine, otherwise it will, you know, stabilize, that the, the world will, will get further destabilized and that may cause some conflict in Asia. This kind of a sense of urgency is more, I think, um, is bigger, relatively bigger factor for Japan to react very strongly. And that this is my observation. Thank you. Um. Yes, I think sitting here, um, the world looks far more complex than just uh, with us or against us kind of world view. I think American can uh, afford it because it's uh, sort of separated by both Pacific and Atlantic Ocean from all the sources of, uh, of danger. A uh, strange coincidence was that uh, just before this whole crisis started, we got the Japanese translation of Stephen Waltz's The Origins of Alliances, uh, which is a book published originally in 1987. Uh, but now uh, it's been the first Japanese translation came out. And uh, one of the things uh, Walt argues is that geography is important. The distance from the source of uh, danger affects your perception of of uh, uh, threat and so america is far away from both uh, Ru uh, russia and china what does distance mean in this uh, age but it still means a lot uh, and and europe's perception is definitely more influenced by what happens to russia i'm not sure if the europeans share the view that russia and china is a monolithic threat i think they still ha uh, have a lots of illusions about how they can persuade china into playing the role of an honest break broker. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Japan's immediate threat is China. Um, and they are kind of reluctant to bundle both of them into the same block because you don't really want to fight with two instead of just one, when, when one is just strong enough. <laughs> And um, the other thing is that our environment is very complex. Um, you talk of them and us, who's us? And we have even difficulty communicating with our the closest neighbor, uh, South Korea. Um, there is political difficulties. Uh, I think the strategic logic is very obvious for any of us that, that we should cooperate. But there's lots of domestic and political difficulties about uh, concrete cooperation between South Korea and Japan. Taiwan is another delicate uh, entity. And then you go further down and South uh, ASEAN countries are very mixed, right? About where to distance themselves. And, and you have the, on the so-called democratic side of India which has been uh, which has been continuing to buy weapons from Russia even throughout this uh, uh, crisis and has uh, uh, chosen to sort of sort of uh, demonstrate itself uh, standing beside uh, uh, Russian leaders. Um, so Asia all in all has shown a very complex picture in which Prime Minister Kishida is trying to somehow uh, forge some sort of un unity. Um, he's going on a trip uh, uh, in the near future to Asian countries, um, trying to somehow create a, a broad support 
for the rule of law, at least. Maybe not against Russia or China, but a support for the rule of law and need for um, probably some sort of energy uh, independence of the region. So, um, you know, it, the world's not that simple uh, for us. We're living in a very complex uh, um, geographic situation. Fine. Thank you. So um, I, I'd like to move to the second part of our discussion, which is more focused on the long term ramifications, uh, policy consequences of the conflict in Ukraine, um, both in terms of uh, how that has changed and will continue to change global world politics. Um, and Iwama Sensei in particular has great expertise in NATO and Europe and, and Germany um, and nuclear issues. And uh, Akita-san recently wrote an excellent piece in Nikkei, Nikkei about China's response to different uh, scenarios of uh, the outcome of Russia-Ukraine. Um, so if you could shed light on how this is shaping global politics, and uh, from that, how will Japan change its foreign policy, defense policy, energy policy, uh, uh, economic security policy, and so on. Um, this time I'd like to start with Iwama Sensei, please. Okay. Um... Uh, lots of questions in a bundle. Um, I think uh, for Japan, uh, we, and we are going through the revision of national security strategy this year. Uh, so we're talking about lots of different things, but I think there's a, a lot more consciousness that we should uh, uh, do better to deal with uh, local conflicts that does not reach th the threshold of, of nuclear war. And uh, that is the most likely conflict in East Asia, um, whichever way you look at it. Uh, we don't have reason to go on to a, a global war and Japan has no need to um, fear about a total uh, invasion of Japan uh, as a whole. But there are lots of uh, local uh, disputes uh, which can go wrong if we send the wrong messages. So I think um, in order to uh, send the right message, meaning that we will defend our interests and our national interests, uh, we have to have postures that really clearly sends this message, uh, which would uh, reconstitute the the deterrence in this area. That's what, um, what I've been talking about ever since uh, um, last summer. And if you uh, just Google um, deterrence for Japan and stability in Asia, you will find a piece uh, written by me and uh, Musashi Murano at Hudson's uh, last summer. Uh, and we did uh, produced a report of that uh, later 21. So I think uh, one of the key points is the longer strike capabilities. We only have a very short one. We need a longer one, possibly once to reach uh, Chinese uh, um, coastlines. That's up to the debate. How far do we go? Uh, do we need ballistic missiles or only cruise missiles? We need to debate about these things, but we definitely need a better capability to deal with local crisis. Uh, and that applies to the NATO side as well. Um, America is moving some of its assets uh, back into um, Eastern Europe, but it's not going to be big um, because we know the total amount of American capabilities and their budget, and it's not increasing dramatically. Um, so uh, American allies has to do more. That's very obvious. And we do our bit in, in the East Asia theater, the Europeans, especially the Germans, and probably the French and the British, uh, also the, the, the smaller partners of NATO has to do more in Europe. And uh, also, I think we there's a lot of need for coordination between NATO and Japan, uh, possibly Australia and South Korea as well, uh, to how to sort of strengthen our capabilities in total, uh, given that America is only America, we, we're not going to sort of uh, have double America, <laughs> like saying, uh, I don't know, double shot uh, espresso or something like that. It's not going to be like that. There's only one America, uh, which has limited resources. And so in order to have a stronger Western free world defense, we need to better coordinate the partners 
uh, in Europe and in Asia. So I think there's a real need to some sort of institutionalization of NATO Japan dialogue, which has been going on for, for several years now, and we've done a lot of dialogues. I think we are up to a stage where we really want to sit down together and count the missiles and uh, other things that we have, uh, missile defense as well, um, look at the map, where are they? Is it in the right position? Is it the right kind that we have? Uh, and really talk, because uh, although lots of people are reluctant, I think we have to face uh, the possibility of Russian Chinese bloc, to say the least. Um, China's reaction has been disappointing. You know, it. Uh, um, you can see Chinese national interest in different ways, uh, but it has chosen uh, the direction uh, that is not uh, in in the interest of us. It has chosen to position itself closer and closer to Russia, and I guess uh, Xi Jinping has his own reason for doing it, um, but. I, I mean, I, I did not exclude the possibility of China making different kinds of choices because uh, the post-war um, international order provides China with certain um, merits that it's pro, um, that you have this rules-based order, including the United Nations, in which China is given a very privileged position. Uh, that it is in China's interest to preserve this order. I think uh, that kind of calculation was not to be excluded at the start of the crisis. And I argue that we should be trying to persuade China that it's not in its interest to position itself too closely to Russia. Uh, but I don't think uh, China has reacted in that way. So it's inevitable that we uh, for the foreseeable future, treat these two countries as, as a very close associates, and therefore Japan and NATO needs to um, better coordinate its efforts, I think. Um, interesting thing is uh, there's a lot of talk about reform of United Nations, uh, UN 2.0 and so on. Um, uh, we should be talking about it because there's so much shortcomings about the United Nations, but it's not going to be easy uh, given its structures. United Nations is a, sort of a, based on the victory of the Allied powers of the Second World War, of which Soviet Union was definitely a huge portion. So um, to change that uh, um, requires something like another war, I think, and it's not, we haven't had it yet. Uh, so it's going to be very easy. I'll stop here and maybe come back later. Thank you very much. Uh, so I would like to make mainly uh, three points. One is about how this invasion changed Japanese changed the Japanese uh, geopolitical landscape, and secondly, uh, uh, answer to uh, Professor Tsui's uh, question about what kind of lesson China will learn, have run, is learning from this uh, Russian invasion, and then how it will mean for Asia or for the world. And thirdly, uh, Japanese long-term strategy after uh, under a new world since uh, February 24th invasion. So first, uh, Japanese geopolitical landscape. Unfortunately, uh, February 24th is totally different world from Japanese perspective. Again, uh, Japan uh, now faces two uh, unfriendly uh, adversary, uh, that is both China and Russia, and then also face a North Korean nuclear missile. Japan is, of course, within the range of nuclear ballistic missile of, of North Korea. This is, uh, uh, you know, first, this situation is uh, maybe most serious since maybe I should say 1991, uh, 1971. 1971, when Nixon visited uh, Beijing and embraced uh, Beijing as a partner, 
you know, China be became a de facto, uh, de facto ally for US and also uh, not ally, but a very, very strong partner for Japan to counter to Soviet Union. So since then, up to the uh, since then, up to 1991, uh, until the time when uh, Soviet, uh, at the time when Soviet Union collapsed finally, China was our side. And then after the collapse of Soviet Union, uh, both Russia and China uh, seemingly, you know, we once hoped that they would become a partner. But now. Uh, Geopolitical picture has changed, and then uh, I should say it is the worst uh, landscape for Japan. Um, if, as Professor Iwama uh, mentioned, uh, not only that, uh, China is seemingly aligned with Russia, even after February 24th. And I assume that uh, Russia, uh, China will keep close distance with Mr. Putin's regime, unfortunately. Uh, and this is very bad news for Japan and also for the world. But there are two reasons, I think, as I, uh, you know, uh, those are two reasons as I, you know, interviewed many experts in Tokyo or other country. One reason is that uh, nightmare for China is that uh, Putin regime will clasp and then uh, China will get isolated and China alone have to uh, face a long-term uh, rivalry vis-a-vis -vis West, especially to the uh, US. So China really needs uh, Russia as a great power to align uh, together to counter the US. And also uh, more importantly, uh, President Xi himself committed to uh, very, very strong solidarity with the Putin regime, President Putin. He signed the joint statement February 4th that defines that uh, Beijing and Moscow cooperation is limitless. He signed it. So if, he, if China now abandoned uh, Mr. Putin, this means that the Xi, President Xi made a very big mistake. I don't think it will happen. So, this means that we will, we means Japan and the world have to uh, endure long-term strategic competition or even more, more, more than that. Uh, China's vision, China and Russia's vision of the world is, to, is totally different from ours. They aim to try to change the current order to be more multiple order. So uh, virtually they want to, you know, destroy a uh, US led world order. But US and other Western allies or partners wants to maintain this existing order. So this is not just a strategic competition over the high tech or maritime security, but the, it is kind of like a clash of a completely different vision of the world order. So this is a one point. And second point is about China's lesson, specifically on uh, what, they, what it means to a Taiwan Strait. Mm, in short term, it is China run the lesson that is that would be a positive for us, for us, because you know, uh, and it, it will make China more cautious because China, uh, as China observed the. Russian military's failure in Ukraine, that will uh, that uh, definitely remind uh, China how it is difficult or unpredictable for them to conduct full-scale invasion to Taiwan. I wouldn't go into detail, but so many, uh, you know, commonality and also, uh, not commonality, but the, you know, Russia is connected, uh, share the land border with Ukraine, but the Taiwan is separated by sea. And also they are paying attention to, uh, uh, power over information warfare, not only by Ukraine, but the Western, Western country as a whole. 
And that is overwhelming, uh, the equa changing the equation between Russia and uh, Ukraine. But in long run, uh, China will draw, it, it is bad, uh, it, it's gonna be a bad news for us because uh, China will examine uh, the weakness or potential kind of like uh, challenges for them to be able to annex Taiwan by force in the future. And I'm sure that they will try to overcome. It is not like uh, six years or five years, I, I think, but uh, within uh, 10 years or 15 years, uh, they will definitely uh, try to overcome. And it doesn't mean that they will uh, invade Taiwan, but uh, it means that they will uh, have a very a plausible, more plausible option to annex Taiwan by force. So short term good, but uh, long term negative. And lastly, I just a short comment is on Japan. Uh, I echoed uh, Professor Iwama's uh, comment. Um, Japan, so this is a wake up call for Japan and Japan will uh, devise the national security strategy for the first time in nine years. And I think in that Japan will uh, make a three commitments. One is to further uh, accelerate uh, the increase of defense budget. I think that uh, maybe it is likely to put the 2% of GDP as a goal in not maybe not short term, but the long term goal. I hope and I think they will define the goal. And also uh, maybe Japan will uh, make a policy change to for uh, self-defense forces to acquire a strike capability. Now, SDF self-defense forces basically focus on defense capability and uh, you know rely on US offense capability. But maybe uh, Japan will change it to have a better deterrence capability. And lastly, Japan will have uh, Japan will try to push for, uh, try to further enhance US-Japan alliance, but uh, also try to reach out to a like-minded country more uh, proactively. Thank you. Um, okay. I'd just like to add a word about energy. Um, it's been popping up in several questions. Um, uh, Akita-san and I talked uh, essentially about what we need to do in, in defense uh, capabilities. Um, I think the real issue is energy, though. Um, sort of a defensive uh, policies are needed to um, sustain the situation, uh, not to let the other side think that we're not ready and they can trample on us. But I think in the longer uh, view, who comes out of this competition victoriously is, I think, who uh, can uh, get the breakthrough in terms of uh, um, technologies related to energy. And I think we're going to have a lot of discussion this year and the next year. This year, uh, Germany is a chair of G7. Next year, it will be Japan. And I think energy will be central to what we discuss, as well as the really short-term reactions to what's happening in Ukraine and so on. Um, how uh, quickly and in what ways do we make ourselves uh, uh, independent from fossil fuels? Uh, um, very concretely, the gas and oil from Russia. Uh, and here, Germany is especially dependent on Russian energy, but Japan also uh, to a lesser extent. And uh, um, I think France has shown a kind of reflex reaction that is going to renew its effort on the nuclear energy side. Um, whether that is the reaction all of us want to take or we want to invest in different kinds of technology and does that technology really have a future there's a lot to be asked but i think this is really a race against time in several means that uh, we make ourselves independent from fossil fuel and make a breakthrough into an, a different type of sustainable society uh, whoever makes it uh, will win the day in the end. I have no doubt about it. Great, um, I wanna go back to geopolitics, but since you raised uh, energy policy and, and this is going back to Yusuke Mitsumori's question about um, 
any possible change in nuclear power plant policy. Uh, he's asking about Japan, but Iwamo Sensei, maybe you can speak to Germany. Uh, Germany has had to cut off basically Nord Stream 2 and there's massive energy need that may not be met for at least a couple of years uh, without Russia's energy, uh, natural gas. So uh, what do you project in, in Germany as well as in Japan? Um, does this bring about a change in their nuclear uh, power policy? Um, in the short term, definitely, uh, because uh, we're going to be short, and especially Germany is going to be short on gas for heating. Um, <laughs> Well, they're, they're really sort of living in a situation that any moment um, Russian gas can just be cut, you know, cut and uh, it's not going to flow anymore. Uh, currently, it's flowing and Germany is paying. And a lot of people denounce Germany for that, that they're not totally cutting off oil and gas uh, import. Uh, and that is feeding Putin's war. Um, you cannot deny that, but on the other hand, uh, you cannot uh, sort of uh, push the nation into energyless uh, situation overnight. I think that's uh, rather irresponsible. But Germany is doing everything to speed up the transition as much as possible. And in that transition, they will have to rely more on nuclear energy because uh, uh, simply uh, they cannot count on Russian gas. They were counting on gas for the transition from uh, the current status to renewables in five, 10 years. But now this gas part is gonna be missing. So they will have to fill it partly with coal and partly with nuclear energy until they have the next generation technology. Uh, but Germany is really serious about making the transition. I'm not sure <laughs> about Japan. Um, I hope it can become equally serious um, I mean, energy transition was on the high top priority of the coalition government and the G7 um, issues uh, this year uh, without Ukraine war. And now with the Ukraine war, it's really, really at the high priority of Japan, um, German government. Um, and Japan is also some kind of... Uh, walking on tight ropes. Uh, we nearly had a blackout, what, several weeks ago, was it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it was like, we were like on 103% of the limit of uh, power here and everybody's kind of, oh no, <laughs> when does it uh, go off? And people were just trying to save energy by turning off this and that and that. Um, it's kind of weird in an advanced society like Japan that we have to do something like that. It's partly because we haven't turned back the nuclear power plants, not, not all, but partly. Um, so that may come. Um, but again, that's not an easy choice to make. Um, personally, uh, I don't believe in relying too much on nuclear power, not at least not to the extent that the French are doing. I don't think that's our that's going to be our choice. I think we need to rely on different sources. Um, we used to rely on something like 30% on nuclear power. Are we going back to that level? It's a national discussion to be had. But um, there are different nuclear uh, power technologies. Um, and Japan's has been rather old dated, up to very old from the 1970s. So I think we have to get back to the table and think about what options are there, including nuclear, but not limited to nuclear, um, and uh, make a, a sort of a midterm plan. Um, we haven't been doing that on energy at all. Uh, so we have to do our homework now. It's not going to be easy, but I think as I said, I think whoever makes it will really sort of make the day and get through this crisis. And whoever doesn't make it will sort of follow behind, maybe fall back as an industrial minister. Great. And then Dad, uh, uh, Yeah, I, I completely agree with uh, Yama Sensei. Nothing to add. Okay. All right. So going back to the geopolitics of it all, um, and this is a question earlier from uh, Jay Wilberforce about how um, it seems like Russia is very useful uh, in theory to balance counter China, 
and it makes sense to move in, in that direction. But given what's going on right now, it, it's becoming increasingly more difficult to, to see that scenario short of you know, Putin's regime falling or something. Uh, but is there a way forward in making that happen after the conflict? Um, and he's worried that uh, strong policy to corner Russia by the United States and other countries would only drive Russia into the arms of China, which is which is what has been happening already. But um, and and Donald Xi raises this scary, uh, worrisome prospect of India kind of joining, moving more in the direction of China and Russia. That would be a, a trouble for the Quad and and Japan and the U.S. and Australia. Um, but you know there are some signs that India is um, uh, might be flirting with that idea. So how do we uh, prevent that from happening? Um, if maybe Yama Sensei could bring in um, European countries, which before the crisis, before the Ukra Ukrainian war, uh, bringing in some like Britain and France, Germany, they brought uh, you know aircraft carrier or a frigate to the Indo-Pacific region to sort of project its uh, their maritime capability. So how, do, how does that play into this uh, international order in the Indo-Pacific region? Um, maybe starting with um, Akita-san this time. Okay, thank you. So uh, I think uh, two major, two key questions. One is about the China and Russia, and secondly, it's about India. So on the first question, uh, I have to confess that uh, maybe in, uh, in past, I mean, in past years, I wrote a commentary several times to insist that we should uh, maintain, maintain stable relations with Russia to uh, not to be able, not to necessarily to drive a wedge. I don't think that we should have an illusion that Japan can, uh, well, Japan alone, of course not, but the West can drive wedge between Beijing and Moscow, but at least try to slow down the pace of the formation of a de facto axis by China and Russia. So I basically once supported the Prime Minister, former Prime Minister Abe's approach to Russia, uh, and I thought it was uh, kind of a, makes sense from the geopolitical uh, calibration so that we can focus on China. But uh, in past maybe two or three years, I started to change my mind. Uh, and that com completely changed my, my mind, of course, after February 24th, uh, because of two things. One is that uh, Russia now is too vulnerable to China, or too rely on, rely on China economically, and too vulnerable to China militarily, especially conventional military capability. And it is kind of very difficult or too late for Russia to be an independent player from China. So it is very sad projection, but uh, in coming years, what we will see is the second is that Russia will become a big North Korea for China, rely on China economically, and also uh, regime will be more like a, a even even more like a dictatorship type of regime. So kind of new North Korean North Korean uh, realization of Russia. Uh, so in that sense, uh, it makes sense, still sense for us to bring Russia back to our side after a Putin regime, but uh, it is, there aren't, there aren't to be, there aren't to be so much hope in short, short term. This is my first point. But second point on this question, I think that we should uh, separate uh, Russia and Putin regime. So that in the long run, uh, so that we in long run, so that we be, will be able to reserve some option for us to work with Russia after Putin will leave the power. I don't know uh, whether it will be a plausible scenario or not. 
but at least uh, it is good idea to leave the kind of room for us for that option by separating Russian regime, a Putin regime, and Russia. So this is on the China Russian uh, question. And on India, uh, actually, I'm traveling to India to attend the conference next week. And I'm uh, watching uh, Indian strategies calculation uh, quite uh, carefully. And I drew two conclusions. One is that, uh, maybe two, maybe one, uh, one conclusion that is basically, uh, India wants to focus on China. Uh, they have a, a land border dispute. So India wants to deter, deter or counter China. That is the first priority. And in that context, uh, they cannot afford to alienate Russia because they rely on Russian weaponry system 70%. So alienating or resenting uh, Russia means they, their military in short term will have serious Problem, so that that will so and then that will weaken the Indian capability to counter China. And secondly, India don't wants to resent Russia because Russia so far maintained a neutrality on the India and China's land border dispute. But uh, so for them, uh, uh, for that reason, uh, they are. Uh, in, maintain neutrality on this war in Ukraine. I think it is bad, to be honest. I, I want India to come to our side because we made a decision. So I want India to make a painful decision. But at the same time, a uh, difficult paradox is that we want India to be able to counter China. So in order to do that, they need a Russian weaponry system. They, in order to do that, they are kind of a, try to maintain a neutrality. So is it kind of like an interest for us to make India to be more, to uh, weaken their deterrent capability vis-a-vis -vis China by taking, by making a decision to sanction Russia? It is maybe there would be a pro and con. And on this specific question, I don't have answer, but uh, I, my short, in short, I think Indian question is a very complex question, not only for India, but also for us. I stop here. Right. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, both very difficult questions. Um, India, China, Russia axis would be a nightmare. <laughs> But um, I think uh, you have to understand the difficulty of countries who share direct land borders. It's not easy. And India is not in NATO. It's not in, even in a direct alliance with the US. Uh, and it also has a Pakistani problem. So not all our interests are going to converge I, and I think you have to accept that. Even inside NATO, Turkey has a different standing point and uh, you have to live with that. Um, well, Turkey in the midterm is, is, a, is a worrisome state, you know, if it's if you can stabilize its uh, domestic politics or not, um, it is a worrying question for NATO as a whole. And Turkey has played a very important role. Uh, we've seen that in this Ukrainian war by blocking the, the straits out of the Black Sea. Um, so, you know, its strategic importance doesn't change, uh, but it always remains as a kind of a weak point in NATO, uh, which is worrisome, but, um, we have to, well, make do with what we have. And what we have is definitely an alliance of maritime countries. Uh, and AUKUS is one of it. France is also part of this FOIP um, naval activities. Um, I think um, 
I'm all for Japan playing a role in AUKUS. Um, because it's not only nuclear submarines, it seems to be about more, although nobody really knows what it's about yet. Uh, but I think our interests are very clear and uh, very um, convergent that we want uh, to maintain uh, free and open sea uh, at the least. And so you give France, um, Japan, Australia all share their interests. Um, and I think we have also very um, similar uh, defense technologies, which forms uh, the very useful basis for further cooperation. Um, Germany, I don't know how far they want to go. Uh, they have to concentrate on land, uh, and I'm sure they're going to bring back tanks and uh, so on to counter um, immediate Russian threat. Um, how far they will cooperate further on Indo-Pacific is an open question. Um, even with two percent defense budget, it's not going to be easy. They have, they've, you know, they've they haven't done the homework for a very long time, uh, and they have a lot of catching up to do, and they have to really sort of concentrate on their relationship with their immediate neighbors like Poland, the Baltics, the the, the Romanians, and so on. Will they have uh, still kind of uh, enough resources to? to um, come over to the, the Pacific, uh, the Indo-Pacific, I'm not really sure. Um, but I think they're more now willing to participate uh, in, in, in um, spiritually, at least, if not materially. Um, they have been kind of wavering for a very long time. They don't want to um, off be offensive to Russia, want to be not to China. Uh, but this uh, Ukrainian war has really push the Germans into, into different sphere. And so there still needs to be some soul searching uh, with in relation to China. It has already happened in Germany-Russia relationships. And this was a very painful break from 50 years tradition of trying to engage Russia in, in through trade, through pipelines, through cultural relationships, it's all these effort that went into um, Russia-German relationship has gone to nothing, and it has been really painful. China-German relationship is essentially um, more economic, and it uh, really it's really about German um, cars selling in China, and uh, auto industry is a very important um, sector. Uh, for Germany as well as for Japan. Uh, here again, we're facing a kind of a, a change in technology uh, and probably a huge change in the industry when we transition to um, electronic vehicles in the coming 5-10 years. And here, China is definitely a player and a competitor. So um, we're going to see interesting and important decisions to be made both by German and Japanese uh, car makers in the coming months and years. Um, the Germans have, the German car makers have not yet really faced up to the, the possibility that China is not a market, it's a competitor. Uh, but they will have to do it in the coming months, I think. If they don't, they're going to be the loser of this race. Um, so, started off with the uh, um, Indo-Pacific and maritime issues, but this really boils down to, on the one hand, energy, on the other hand, cars. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. my point of view, and very suitable to Nikkei Shinbun somehow. <laughs> <laughs> great, great. Um, I think we have to close soon, but I just want to do one uh, last round of uh, rapid fire question, then you can choose which questions you might want to answer. Uh, one question is from Hideki Sato, uh, who, who asks about UN Security Council reform. Um, everybody, well, those who follow the history of genocide and sec UN Security Council's response to genocide cases would know that it, it, it really cannot do much on those issues. Uh, but this uh, conflict really you know, laid bare 
uh, the dysfunction of the United Nations when um, a nuclear power with a permanent membership in the Security Council goes rogue. Uh, so what can we do to change that? And maybe it's an opportunity for Japan, which has been calling for, and Germany, uh, which have been calling for um, UN reform. Um, and he also ask, asks about strengthening uh, ICJ, International Court of Justice. Uh, I would add ICC, International Criminal Court as well. Um, I mean, it hasn't been a kind time decade or so for transnational institutions like them. Uh, but, you know, NATO just made a major comeback, right, as a result of this conference. So maybe there's some hope there. Uh, another question is about, you know, every country is asking, uh, every Western country is asking, what can we do more to help Ukraine? And what can Japan do more to help Ukraine? It doesn't seem like there's a lot to be done militarily, uh, but especially in terms of economic rebuilding once the conflict is over of Ukraine, maybe there's a lot more Japan can do, uh, taking in of evacuees, if not refugees, um, maybe Japan can do more. So if you could um, share insight, your insight on what Japan might be able to do more. Um, and I could add a couple more, but it's time is up. So I'll just, um, let you choose uh, one or both of those questions to answer. Whoever might want to go. Akita-san? Oh, OK, OK. Thank you very much for uh, great questions. So maybe uh, I, I can mention also on the Ukraine, uh, what Japan can do for Ukraine, but I mainly will answer uh, on the UN Security Council. Um, I've been talking with officials or experts on this subject. Uh, quite frequently since February 24th. And so this is not only my uh, view, but uh, this is kind of a majority of view, I think, among Japanese experts and officials. That is, uh, UN itself is a very, very important uh, body. UN have many, many kind of organization, such as UNHCR, WHO, and you know, uh, many. But UN Security Council is, uh, we cannot hope that UN Security Council will function in a way to defend uh, <laughs> world order, especially in this kind of crisis, because uh, Russia have a veto power. And if there were to be a crisis in Taiwan, I will don't uh, expect that China will, you know, uh, we expect that China, it's very likely that China will use veto to, for UN Security Council to take action. So, so this is kind of common sense observation. So prescription, as for prescription, uh, I think there are two. One is to pressure uh, China and Russia more and more by using a vote at UN assemble. Of course, it doesn't stop uh, for Russia to use veto power, but at least we can uh, increase the political and the diplomatic pressure to Russia when they, and also raise the cost for them to use veto power. So this is not the solution, but that this is uh, uh, one of the uh, prescription. But more important prescription is to establish uh, some form of a coalition outside UN to pressure UN. Uh, if UN will not, UN Security Council will not change maybe we should further, we should further institutionalize uh, the framework by like-minded country to act together when UN Security Council cannot act. Specifically, I, I wrote commentary uh, to uh, propose for G7 country to institutionalize G7 framework by uh, defining its mission and its principle and agree on the, on the document and then further expand the membership or to by reaching out to a country like Australia or South Korea and other you know, like-minded country. And of course there is a kind of a risk 
this kind of institutionalization of G7 or like-minded countries framework will further divide uh, the country, uh, the divide between the West and other country, especially uh, those countries who that abstained or opposed to anti-Russian resolution. But uh, it is any, any prescription, prescription have a pro and con. So I think that we should think about it uh, more seriously. On the Ukraine, uh, I think what Japan, what Japan should do now is to make whatever it takes to uh, make Putin's invasion fail. That will, you know, minimize the cost for Russia, Ukraine to uh, reconstruct economically. But of course, uh, Japan uh, can uh, provide economic and humanitarian assistance to uh, build post-war uh, Ukraine uh, infrastructure and also uh, post and uh, also uh, to rebuild uh, Ukraine after the war. Thank you. Yes, um, thank you. Um, I totally agree with uh, the san that uh, United Nations is not only Security Council, it also has General Assembly, which should be used more uh, creatively, I think. Um, the peace and security matter is, uh, uh, in the first uh, sense, is Security Council matters, but it, when it doesn't function like it's not currently, uh, and in the past there have been examples, the General Assembly has been uh, the part uh, to discuss matters when Security Council is not functioning in the way it should. So I think the um, diplomats of the world should be more creative about the way they use General Assembly to come up with the immediately needed solutions and uh, and then just go ahead with the coalition of the willing, having the authorization of the General Assembly, if not the Security Council. Um, I think that's uh, worth taking the risk and, and it's very much worth doing. Um, human rights violations and strengthening the ECC and ECJ, we we have a lot to do there and uh, Tsutsu Sensei is more of an expert here than me, um, but I think uh, what can be said uh, from this particular crisis is that the um, morality has a meaning and it has strength, you know, the, the um, weakest point I think of the the so-called uh, very strict realists who think only the power matters. Um, I think they're wrong. Um, power matters, but so does morality. And Putin is on the weaker side precisely because he has totally neglected the power of the morality and how people of the world feel um, what's wrong and what's right. And a lot of people just feel so angry about the way Putin totally neglects the value of things like life and human rights, and that plays a role. And so we, as experts, have the obligation to better build institutions who can really give these feelings a more concrete form. Um, institutions like ICC and ACJ have a long way to go, but I think we should start here and now by collecting evidence of all the war crimes committed on the scene. And I think that Japan should play a role there as well. Um, uh, our forensic and, and these things, Japanese police has a very good expertise. So I think we can play a role there. Um, I know that we're not going to be able to arrest Putin in the near future and put him on trial. It's not going to happen unless Russia really collapses and we <laughs> we somehow capture Putin like uh, uh, the way we did Milosevic. Um, I don't know if that's going to happen. It's not impossible, but I don't see a high probability that it will happen. Even if we don't capture Putin, um, I think we should uh, find ways to really pin down the things he did and the legality of the things he did in a very concrete legal way, work it through the institutions that we have and have it as a case. 
that will have effects, long-term effects, not a short-term effect, but it would definitely have longer time effects. We've done that with Milosevic, took years, you know, it took really years, but I think it was not meaningless that we went there through all that and saw the end of Milosevic as a very sorry figure. Um, probably it won't happen to Putin, but still I think we should try to really pinpoint what has he done, in what, in what sense is it illegal, and it is illegal, what kind of crime has he committed, why is it illegal since when and all, based on which, which international law, I think we should set them out clearly, so that uh, people saying that uh, international politics is only about power and destruction uh, would have to think twice. I think that's really important, and there, um, Japan should play a role. Um, I'm happy that Japanese uh, self-defense forces sending airplanes. I think we could do more there on the place to help the refugees. Um, they were pouring out. Now some of them are trying to get back. Uh, in either way, they're going to need a lot of help, I think. And uh, um, so I'm happy that uh, Prime Minister Kishida is probably traveling to Europe after Asia to find out uh, in place what's really needed, what kind of help can we provide. And I want uh, Japan to be really creative there, uh, use its imagination, what sort of capability do we have that Europe does not have, but we can provide. I think there's a, a lot more that can be done. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you so much. That's a great place to end. I couldn't agree with you more about how uh, power is important, but it's not everything. Morality, ideas, those things do matter. So thank you for um, sharing your insights with us. And I apologize for going, I promised you 90 minutes at most and we're close to hundred minute mark. Um, but really it was a very informative and insightful discussion. And thank you to the audience for sticking around. Um, so many people actually stuck on and I'm really um, grateful for that. Um, again, uh, great appreciation for sharing your uh, expertise and insights, Akita-san and Iwama-sensei. Maybe next time soon. Thank you. Thank you very much for having us. Yes, it was a pleasure. Thank you.